that's what you'd call I'd be viral now. That's Penny. I want to get that's Heat magazine. And in its day, the columnists were king. And in its day, that was me, the most famous person in the world. That was the show for half hour. That was the show, me in the shower. Were they allowed to do that? Who knows? I mean, I've got a lot of. right through college, right the whole thing, and that was brilliant. And, and when I was on stage, it was fantastic. And he goes, well, we'll pick you up. Where are you? I said, I'm at Stratford. He said, we'll hide somewhere. So we're hid in a bush for an hour. I just meet such beautiful people now, Penny. Penny Ellis, how are you, my darling? Hello, Chris. I'm fine. Thank you for having me on your podcast. You're looking absolutely, okay. um, absolutely beautiful today. Oh, thank you. I made a bit of an effort for you. Bit of an old journey uh, for you since was it Big Brother Two? You were you were in? Yeah, so 2001. But um, since 2020, um, ironically, you know, lockdown, uh, life has changed completely, and I've claimed back my narrative. And I've created a life for myself that's calm, order and sane, rather than full of chaos, judgment, accusations and just trauma. So and it's been healing. I'm still healing um, because you don't, there's scars there. Um, mm. But I write about that very openly, um, my mental struggles. And um, I just hope it helps someone else with whatever circumstance they're in. The great thing about this journey, Penny, sorry, I'm, talking a lot already but you know we're all healing those of us that have been through trauma and everyone watching now we you know you know who you are and we get it folks and we we support each other and uh the great thing is i just meet such beautiful people now penny you know i i meet the people that i've waited all my life to meet um and i don't need to explain myself to them yeah. it's like they know where i've been Yes. And that's not a conversation we need to have. We talk about beauty, love, empathy, kindness, yeah, uh, laughs. You know, we, we, we do a few, um, you know, weekends away and this kind of stuff. But anyway, listen, I'm talking uh, too much. What I wanted to ask you, Penny, is I saw on your Amazon page. So, friends, Penny's book is Meet Me at the Mirror. There's a link below. You lived in Singapore, Cyprus, and England as a child. Yes. And I'm going to guess you were in a military family. Yes. My dad was in the Air Force. Um, so I was born in Singapore, um, and uh, we went to Cyprus, and that was where um, I ha um, encountered a, a bit of child abuse by the neighbour. Sorry about that one. Um, and that, I think, broke a bit of me inside that allowed people to manipulate me as I see in cycles in my life um and the other thing that happened was we were caught up in the war in 74 so my dad was being used um and was at the base and the bombs were dropping we put the mattresses around the living room um and um we didn't we, we thought we were not going to get away the next door neighbor put her put her lettuce into a rabbit's hutch and then got the telly and drove on the top of the car and drove off. So mm. my mum sat on the step crying and I, I was only five and I went outside to just try and find a lift, um, which I managed to find in amongst all this shooting. Um, and they were suddenly all the shooting stopped. I think there was like a, a few minutes reprieve for us to be able to get out of Limassol. But the most terrible thing I saw, um, if I'm allowed to say, was um, as we were leaving, Women were trying to squeeze their babies through the through the door through the window of our car to um, for us to take them to safety. So that when I came to live in Tunbridge Wells, I had night terrors. Mum had to um, nail my window shut because I used to try and climb out of it. 
and I never got counselling for that. Hmm. Um, and maybe that's something that I carried with me. And I had, um, along with that, I didn't have um, proper development, you know, of my breasts, ironically, sorry to be rude. And then the doctor just said, oh, you should have been born a boy. So it's quite funny in the house, because when I was in the house, I said as a joke to the housemates, I used to be a man. And it sent the big brother producer into a flurry for two days trying to find stories about that one. <laughs> but I think those things, if you don't deal with them at the root, you are going to take them with you. Um, and so even before Big Brother, life was very destructive cycles. So I was constantly getting myself into chaos and 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 abusive relationships. And, you know, so even though I had my faith, um, I kept just having my mum called it a vice grip. Something used to grip me and I'd go for it, even if it was destroying me. Um, mm. And I found myself with really chronic OCD to the point that I was checking once um, I was in hospital with it twice. I got shingles and everything. But then I was checking the cupboard and the kettle was boiling just underneath the cupboard, but I couldn't stop my counting. So I literally burnt my skin through. I mean, it's, it gets that extreme in your life where you're just trying to find whatever you've gone through, um, a level of reality and a level of, of, of control. Mm -hmm. And then obviously, um, you know, like I write in my book, I should have gone for counselling and gone home instead of going into the biggest reality the only reality TV show <laughs> on planet Earth. You know, I mean, I was a right old mess when I went in there. Um, they now get included. It's quite interesting. 2018, they get, in, they get um, well, duty of care is now in place. So they get a manager and they get finance help and they get all that. And then also they, they, they now training, 2020, I think it is, they now train the producers for inclusion. Um, which means that they get trained to see when they audition people and they're allowed to look at the doctor's records as well. If that person is stable enough, like if someone goes in the army, you know, you get checked over, don't you? So if you're stable enough to go in. Um, and then on the 9th of June, when I came out, they said I was in the offices of the psychologist for, for hours and hours being, you know, whatever it is, de de toxic from the house. And I wasn't, I was being manipulated at the, um, at, at the magazine that I, well, uh, you know, in my opinion, um, the magazine I chose uh, to do my interview with. Um, and I wasn't, I didn't get any counselling, didn't get any financial help. I didn't get management. I mean, everything I'm doing now, I'm doing on my own. I don't have anyone. Um, and it's quite funny. One of the ex-Big Brother contestants said on Twitter, darling, you're launching a book, not a free pizza leaflet. <laughs> she said, we need to find you management. I'm like, what's that? No one's ever helped me. In my life, I've always been very, very self-sufficient. Got a very mm. strong mother and father, but I've always done. I've always worked or uh, owned my flat at twenty. You know, I've always done my work to myself. So whatever I've lost, it's what I've I've earned. You know, and I've always had stuff since I was about eleven. I've been very, very independent. So I don't ask for help, but I think, and I write it in my book. You have to ask for help, and there's something in me now that sort of is like saying, you know you know help me and and being more open about that about myself you know instead of thinking I can just get on and do everything and quietly not uh, uh, and uh, uh, friends didn't know friends didn't know that I was really suffering and they they write their testimonials in my book you know and I didn't I, did, I always give over this air of yay you know and you can't do that whatever you're going through in life you've got to be um honest with yourself and then reach out to, the, like you're saying, to the right people mm -hmm. and the right people will help you. And you're saying earlier about the oyster. Well, the, the pearl in that is only comes from the grit, doesn't it? That creates the oyster. So the challenge when the rubber hits the road, what are you going to be? You're going to become nasty and bitter and angry about whatever your situation is, uh, you know, or are you going to try and get up again? You know, can you get up, get busy living? Like it says in Shawshank Redemption, you know, can you get up again? And I really want, really want to help people get up again. And I really hope, and there's some people that just can't get up again. So there, for the grace of God, I didn't kill myself, you know, but 38 other reality stars did, you know, and mm -hmm. there, for the grace of God, I didn't really, really hurt myself. You know what I mean? But that's, I must have had some strength in me. And I think I'm learning now that that strength is there and I didn't recognise it before. You know, but that's mm -hmm. quite scary for me to suddenly think I'm, I really am strong enough.
I mentioned the military background, Penny, because I knew a second I read that, I thought childhood trauma. Right. Yeah. We we I've never had a military child, um, if we can call them that, on my show, or indeed met one in life that they haven't introduced themselves to me as, "Hi, Chris, I'm a military brat," <laughs> and I'm like, "Don't label yourself with something so horribly negative." Yeah. But what you're essentially saying is. I was shoved from pillar to post so much as a child that I never fitted in. I probably got bullied. Prob- you know, daddy was away most of my life, which is taken as a rejection penny, isn't it? As a, when, when, when you're a, when well, he, you're a yeah. child. Well, he was around, so it wasn't. Uh, he wasn't. He was only. He wasn't away. Away. He wasn't like a really big, big you know, mm. person in the military. So I mean if there's a war war, <laughs> daddy has yeah. to go away. And and, and <laughs> these days mum well and and mummy as well, obviously. But when we look at our journeys, so much of it is traced back to childhood, Penny. This is the origins of of unresolved trauma. The stuff that happens later in life, like for you it was Big Brother, for me it was crystal methamphetamine, <laughs> right? But yeah. similar like nemesis, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, catalyst that then churns up all this unresolved stuff from your childhood that no one's ever helped you to deal with because, you know, they don't know. It's funny you mentioned the military. They'll give you a physical med- medical to check you haven't got, like, yeah. I mean, bunions or something, right? They don't ask about them, you know, uh, and, and, unless the mental stuff's glowingly obvious on your record, there's no examination because right. if if they were to take out all the mentally unstable people... And by that, I mean those dealing with trauma. Yeah. Um, or, you know, uh, that would be most of the military gone. <laughs> yeah. So, yes. So, no, I'm, what I'm trying to say, Penny, is I, I really, uh, you know, I feel for you. Let's, let's talk about your experience then, because you said that you auditioned ac- accidentally. Well, like with everything, I think, like you're saying there, it made me think, you know, we kept, I kept doing things in sections and then, drop all that and do something else you know so we'd live uh, maybe that goes back to that you know where so I was and I suddenly thought oh uh, well I, I ran upstairs I was in the middle of a lesson and I ran upstairs because I wanted my theatre group to go on big breakfast so I quickly left the lesson which you're not allowed to do and legged it up to the staff room area the English staff room and quickly phoned up this number and they said an automated voice you've got through to the big brother hotline leave your number well, I, I thought I didn't, you know, didn't listen to that. I thought, oh, it must be, a mis- I didn't even know what, you know, I hadn't watched Big Brother. You know, in those days, you didn't watch reality people on telly and I hadn't watched Big Brother and I didn't know even that he'd been on. I mean, how stupid am I? And I never watched it before I went in, never researched any of it. Anyway, and then, um, and so I quickly left my name and address. And then next thing you know, I get a massive letter through and an application form. So I took it into gr- my school and I'm very close to my form girls. They're all in my book because I'm still best friends with eight of them, sort of 30 years on. And um, and my drama group, and they said, oh, we'll fill this in with you. So, and then we had to make a VHS video and I wouldn't have done it because I never used a VHS. I didn't know, I said, I'm not going to make a video. I've never made a video. Look at us nowadays, 2023. Anyway, they made a video. Um, I put that on my TikTok, like just right daft thing. Nina's, Nina's holding the video and I'm saying it's not on yet is it she's going yes I'm taping it and I'm like don't turn it off I don't know how to edit it I'll have to just send it so then I sent it in um after a, a, about two three weeks of scrunching it in my bag um you know writing it in boring parents evening letters um, pe- you know desk by powerpoint meetings so when the psychologist saw my I had one meeting there he goes why did you write all up the side of your um application form it's so interesting and I'm like well you know I was just doing it on the tube and doing it on the loo I don't know you know just writing bits when I felt like it and so that was that one um and then I went to the auditions they were ever so polite you know people would ju- we just had to do role play and I thought that's fun like um you know like tie each other in a knot and then unknot each other so no one was trying to be showing off and then they said they lost my tape so they said we, you know, uh, no, what was it? Oh no! Then I got a letter saying you're going to be one of the one of them that goes in, but you may not go in first. They were already creating that expect the unexpected, a really sort of like keeping you on edge. 
and you may be you've chosen but if you don't go in you might go in a week or two after whatever and I thought well blimey I've already told the school who gave me a letter saying we expect you back on the first day after you come out because no one thought it was going to go anywhere no one knew what reality telly was so I've got a letter saying that <clears throat> I didn't go to the union and get any advice I didn't think I had to didn't read whatever I signed you know I, I trusted these people and then they said they lost my tape so they can't have me in or was that before? Anyway, and then I thought, well, that's it. And then a couple of weeks later, they re one of the guys said, oh, I want to redo your tape. And then they said, we're definitely having you. And then on the day I was finishing school and I was supposed to go in on the Monday. So I had the weekend to pack my suitcase and all sorts of everything. Um, I got a, As I left school, I got a phone call from the producer saying that the, the, the newspapers have got your name. So we can't get can't put you in. I thought, oh, blimey. Because I'd let, let my flat out to my cousin and my best friend. So I had nowhere to go when I got out. I don't know why I did that. See, these crazy rash decisions. Um, I give obviously told they've got a supply teacher in. I thought, what am I going to do now? And he goes, well, we'll pick you up. Where are you? I said, I'm at Stratford. He said, well, hide somewhere. So I hid in a bush for an hour, terrified that this journalist was going to find me. Then they took me to this, what was then the Sistel Hotel in Tower Bridge, and that's then obviously, you know, the, the, then I then obviously the, a couple of days later, the nation knew my name, you know, which I didn't know. You don't know anything, you know, once once you're in there, you don't know what's being said about you. So and then I was on the front pages of every magazine, every everywhere all over the world for at least two, three weeks. I mean, I've, you know, look, I want to go look at that. That's the viral. That's heat. Look at that. That's that's what you'd call. I'd be viral now. That's Penny. I want to get. That's Heat magazine, and in its day, the columnists were king, and in its day, that was me, the most famous person in the world for at least two or three. Uh, well, that that magazine comes out for two weeks. Can you imagine someone? They would only have a magazine, and you know, like we used to as children, and you'd read that over the next two weeks. That one magazine. It's funny, isn't it? Now all that information that's coming at us. You know, and then I, I mean, I kept all this stuff, but I never, look what, I mean, this, this shower thing, look at that, rude. That Sunday, the second Sunday, so it's, that was the show for half hour. That was the show, me in the shower. Were they allowed to do that? Who knows? I mean, I've got to laugh. Um, stupid headlines. Teach hated my Brilla Pad haircut. Who cares? Um, and absolutely nuts. You know, it's just, Penny wants to go for it all the way. I'm too much of a woman. You know, and I, I don't know, I didn't question it. I thought, well, whatever. But at the end of the day, it's a funny old world, but I didn't realise, you know, what I was letting myself in for. Mm -hmm. I didn't really, you know, I did because I didn't understand it because it wasn't around. Um, and then when I came out, like you're saying about, about people, I made the decisions on my own and I made the wrong decisions. So I write about that. It's very painful for me because the, um, the, the, I didn't take the... Every single newspaper wanted wanted to wanted me to have an exclusive, and um, I thought I'll go with OK Magazine because in those days you, you I thought oh, good they'll give me like a Hollywood glamorous ball ground or something to wear. Um, no, no way. They they I took me one pound ninety nine knickers, my little stuff from Islington Market. That's on the front of OK Mag, and then this 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 is a bit much, but. Um, they they then may be getting the bath and they said we're not going to pay you unless you do this picture and they did the um this picture which is really rude so that's a quick like, horrendous and then they sold that to the tabloids so they sold mm. that before they even paid me i I've, I've never um you know i've let it I, I didn't do anything about it because in those days what what you're supposed to do you know you, you you're just an ordinary person no one's helping you so you just let all this stuff happen to you and you hope it goes away because in our day it was fish and chip paper. But then the growth of social media, none of it went away. It just got stronger and stronger. And like once it's out there, it just grows and grows and grows. So it's, it's been terrifying because you'll, you, you, you go into something, you think it's just going to last two weeks. And 23 years later, it's, it's as real as anything. There's a, that the, the, they write about me every year. And in 2020, Ryland put on his Twitter page, you know, let's remember Dane Penny. And then for the 20th anniversary, out of all Big Brother people, they use the same story they've used all these years. 
which is Penny, the English teacher, <clears throat> uh, dropped her towel and washed naked in the shower. And they used that for an Alison Hammond story, a Kate Lorna story, and they used it to launch the 20th anniversary of Big Brother. Why me? Why, why me? They, thousands, of, thousands of Big Brother people, you know, and ev everything. They had a, last year, it was an OK magazine. Penny has a fondness for cats and has gone back to Christianity. You know, it's, it's just constant. Penny has tried to go back to teaching. Penny who dropped her towel has gone back to, you know, and I'm thinking, what, why are you writing about me? You know, I mean, I'm, I, I, don't, I didn't look for it, but I probably could have <clears throat> become, you know, probably could have really gone for it. I'm, you know, but I mean, I, I really like what I'm, like you're saying, enjoying myself now. So I'm going to a free course in February to learn podcasting. And I thought I'd set up a little podcast, I'd sit there with my cat, you know, it can be Sweetie and Penny's podcast. Why not? And have a laugh. But even if it doesn't go anywhere, enjoying myself. I really enjoy doing my TikToks. I don't, I don't look and think, oh, oh, you know, oh, you know, someone's, you know, got clicked, liked it. If no one wants to like it, that's fine. Like you're saying, if, if you do it because you enjoy it and because you've got a message, because some of this stuff people do when they're putting lip gloss on and selling hair products or whatever, aren't they? But I want to do, I just want to do something where I could like, you're, like where you're talking and you're caring, you know, I don't want to do it for me, Penny, big brother, you know, whoa, look, here I am. There's one little comment, this bloke, when you've had your five, 50 minutes of fame, well, I'm, you missed the point. I don't want the, not ask for the fame. I just want to just tell my story if anyone wants to help, if it helps anyone. And it, it has so far. Yeah, it's that thing, though, Penny, isn't it? And we, you have to remember what, what comes out of other people's mouths or out of their keyboards <coughs> that that's just a reflection of where they are it's usually the fact that they've probably got unresolved childhood trauma and unlike us folks yeah. who who have recognized it and we we take steps to you know to manage it and heal from it so we become loving kind caring empathic individuals um they're still battling and you you've got to feel you've got to yeah. feel feel a bit of empathy for them, haven't you? Everyone needs something and people will have to live off something. And for some people, they feed off that anger or bitterness or whatever, and they won't, they won't be happy. You know, they just yeah. can't be happy. And I, I worry about that because if we're, if we're alive, we've got another chance, you know, to get, to get happiness. And I'd say, find something that, you know, find something, please, or find someone, but to find happiness you know again I, mean, I met mark in um 2010 the poor bloke because obviously i've been through such destructive couple of relationships awful i mean i treat i went into that cycle you know why didn't you ring you know paranoia and insecurity and um jealousy and um i was an absolute psycho because i had a terrible insecurity about trusting anyone and it, it suddenly in 2020, he suddenly looked at me and went, I don't recognise you. <laughs> You're a completely different person. Because I'd finally, you know, well, probably 2018, I finally started to not be that. Don't need to have a go and have a dig. But you see so many relationships, you know, where someone's bullied. You know, bullying just doesn't happen on the, you know, over our internet and stuff. Bullying happens quietly behind closed doors, you know. And I think men get, you know, men, we've got abused men, we've got abused women, you know, and I was very, very aggressive towards Mark and very, very, very um, absolutely psychotic, you know, at times. Poor bloke. Who, who's Mark, Penny? Oh, so he's my husband. Yeah, okay. finally, 45. So, and then everyone said to him, are you sure? He said, they said to him, are you sure? She's really hard work. But it's taken us, you know, we're now within reason, got a few challenges, but, you know, it's taken us this much. And I think if you if you don't come from a place of love, you know, then then what's the point? You know, if you and my mum always says, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. And um, but it is very difficult because we're all under a lot of stress and we're all under a lot of things that we hoped might change. And a lot of people dreamt of things that never, never, never came true. You know, so they're probably sitting there thinking, oh, I would have loved to have done that. You know, and, and so they're poor little, you know, they, they, did, they didn't get that chance. And like my mum said to me over the years, you, you know, out of all of this sadness and all of this 
um, you know, various experiences. But at least you had that experience. Who else gets that? You know, because I had a year of absolutely um, massive fame because like yourself, meet someone, they'd like me, so they'd, they'd take me under their wing. So you name it. And there's a massive section in my book of all the famous people that were my friends. Can you name a few just so we can get an angle on it? Well, yeah. So, well, Nicky Haslam, uh, he was a socialite. So I end up at this art gallery with Bob Geldof, um, Neil Gallagher, um, uh, Bill Wyman, um, you know, and he's like, she's with me and I had a right laugh. And I go to the late Heath Ledger's um, thing, you know, uh, film, chat with him upstairs, went at uh, Robbie Williams's party with um, Mike Addy, me and Mike Addy sat and drank all the cocktails. He just had a baby, not him, but his wife. Wacky Wacky, Atomic Kitten, I went to Emma Bunting's birthday party, Bestie Friends, uh, Atomic Kitten. I was there when um, uh, Sugar Babes, when she got the job with Sugar Babes, then she used to ring me in London. Uh, Duncan was my friend from Blue. He's my friend about three or four years. He used to ring me in the classroom in 2004. Went for dinner with late Silla Black, Joan Collins. Went with Vanessa Feltz, here then everywhere, because I knew Michael from Closer. Got to know loads of theatre people. So sat with uh, Paul McCartney watching a theatre show. Oh, the funniest thing. Oh, yeah, funniest thing ever. I went to Mardi Gras. Um, did it, I, don't know, I don't know I've got paid for some of this stuff. And Graham Norton went, darling, introduced with me. So I had to introduce steps on stage. <laughs> 88,000 people. So I dance on there with my little pink boa. And I think I just go on there, go, hi, welcome, everyone. Here's steps. Oh, man. 88,000 people start cheering <clears throat> for 15 minutes. <laughs> Stats looked horrific. But because in those days, because I had it a lot from some of the bands, I met all the bands. So I used to go to all the, all the clubs and I met all the bands, you name it, who was out at the time. And some of them wouldn't sit in the VIP area with me. I won't say who they were because um, they're like, who, why are you famous? And I understand that because they'd learnt their trade. And I, I hadn't learned my trade at all. You know, I'm just famous for me, for feeding chickens. But um, so Graham's looking at me. I'm looking at Graham. Steps are looking at me like, what is going on? So I thought, well, I better get off this day. So I went, bye, everyone. I waved me boa. <laughs> About another 10 minutes later, 20 minutes later, I don't know. Oh, it went on forever. So embarrassed. So embarrassed. And then I, at the end, they're all charging at me because you, you're in this VIP back area, aren't you? And then one of the articles said, you know, that of all the stars that were there that day, everyone flocked to Penny. Um, she, um, they they used it quite a nasty, you know, they like to put a nasty on it. Um, and then Graham Norton said she's not as nutty as she was on telly. So funny. And I'm standing there with him and Lorraine Kelly and that, that bloke who does G-A-Y and, oh, I don't know. Yeah. And then Jules Holland. Yeah. You know, a really good friendship with that band. Mm. Really lovely nights, lovely times. And you'd, you'd go, you'd be allowed in this club that was in Soho, and it was only fame. It was only a a, a star celebrities were in there because it's a place where they could let their hair down, just be normal. You know, no one else was allowed in. So I saw. Um, there's lots of things I didn't write about, but there was some right going right laughs in there. I must say. So I've had an amazing time. I had a a, jet, a private aeroplane over to Ireland to do Miss Ireland red carpet treatment, met by the mayor of Limerick. People met me, and then they gave me work but I didn't know how to develop it because I didn't have anyone to help me so I worked right up to June 2002 and then I but the trouble is I got really severe depression and I just stopped doing, going to things so I didn't turn up for Mardi Gras in um I was invited to do Mardi Gras but that year I didn't I didn't go to massive things I was invited to so embarrassing and so regret that some charity mm -hmm. things as well I did quite a lot of charity stuff but I didn't turn up I just lay in my bed and my mum had to fly over from Spain so I didn't get out of bed for about a month. I just lost it. I was an absolute mess. And I piled on the weight and I was absolutely depressed. And I just just couldn't cope with it all. And I never asked for any help. I never asked anyone for a job. You know, I knew everyone. I knew everyone in the industry. What year was this, Penny? That was 2001. What, when, you were when you were depressed? No, no, no. Sorry, 2002. Probably by about uh, April 2002, I suddenly hit a wall. And I thought I, 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 I had so many, so many, I was out at everything, you know, they wanted me to host big, I think I used to big breakfast. I did this, I did, oh, I did, you name it. There was all sorts. And I just could, I did, I wanted my life. I wanted, I wanted to just cook a dinner and 
you know, go to the cinema and, you know, feed a cat. You know what I mean? I just couldn't, because when you've got fame, it, it, it's a, it, you've got to maintain it. That's why they have all those people around them. That's why some of them turn to religion, you know, like that, that you know, Scientology and stuff, you know, whatever they want. You know, people need something when they've got that much fame. That's why they've got a manager, so much going on. But I, mum said, you must have made a million and lost a million. Honestly, I, I don't know where it all went. I was absolutely loony, I just, but I couldn't cope by, I just couldn't cope with it all by, by um, and the paparazzi, you see, because then it was just still tabloids. I was followed all the time. And then the car, if I got into a car, they'd be round it, shake, shake, shake with all the flashy lights. And I just thought I need, I need, I need to, I know I just need to do something normal, mm. you know, but I, but I should have got advice and I should have, got advice and then I could have maybe done something a bit better because um I came back here and then I then I went to try and supply teach um in the September because oh the other thing that happened oh dear is um when I came out the house they took my teaching certificate off me and put it in the sexual offenders file so I was in the right state about that and my friend Paul wrote loads of letters so I got my teaching qualification back July 2002, but I came down here to teach and I thought, come home. As my sister was here from London. She'd moved down and my mum and dad, you know, we all had this house. Um, and um, I went there the next day they phoned me and said, you're not allowed, you can't come back. There's 500 people outside wanting your autograph. I was like, oh, no. Because I thought if I come to Hastings, no one will know me in Hastings. I thought it was just London. <laughs> so then I went and cleaned out beer cellars for 3 95 so no one will find me down here. <laughs> and I hid away. Right. And then I went and then I tried. Yeah. And then I tried to keep te I tried teaching again and I got two years at a job. But then this lady got really jealous and she found everything on the Internet, and put it on the head's desk. And it got me so worked up. I got I got I had a massive breakdown and I tried jamming on the round and I went all the whole side of my face. Everything was paralyzed and I couldn't a death. So it went on for about six months. I was at, paralyzed on this side, uh, absolute state. And then I got um, a little um, waitressing job. And I did that till uh, 2000, uh, 2010. And then when I met Mark, he said, well, you might, you might as well go back to teaching now. And I thought, well, yeah, I probably can. They'll have forgotten about it. Oh, worst years of my life. So, it, you know, because the children have got it on their mobiles. So next thing you know, they're getting it all up. You know, you name it, me, my towel drop, everything. You, Cause some of this stuff you can't get off because mm. Google say some of it is public, public interest. Was that the, the towel dropping thing? Was that all blurred out for the telly or, or I, 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 I've never watched no. big brother. So I don't really yeah, know. I don't how... think, it, I don't think, I don't think it was. I don't think. And it was on that E4 because in those days, that you had to subscribe like we do now mm. for various things. And so they didn't have to put that in. I've read Jean Ritchie's book. Brian flashes his, you know what, at Narinda twice. And she says, I've never seen a, a white one. If that wasn't in the, in the show, the swearing that went on in the house, not that I'm being rude about them, the talk about sex in the house was unbelievable because obviously we're bored. So there's lots of stuff that... Even Dean, he was in there till the very end. And he came out, he said it was really angry for two years or three years because of all the strange edits. It just was strange edits. I challenge anyone, if you get filmed for 24 hours and it gets edited into a 30 minute show, what are you gonna see of yourself? And that's mm. what they did. And I'm, 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 and I'm sure they got away with edits because that doing the whole show and me washing in the shower. Imagine that now on telly, someone would have a go, wouldn't they? you know, mental health. Um, and at the end of the day, they didn't have to show that. To I wasn't, th the producer said, you're safe because we've got a 15 minute, you're safe in the house because you've got 15 minute time delay. So if anything happens, we've always got a 15 minute time delay. Well, where was that 15 minutes then? Mm. So I'm washed, I'm doing what everyone else was doing. Ev someone else was drying themselves with a towel. I. Someone else was washing. So we're all doing the same. Who doesn't wash naked in the shower and who doesn't dry themselves off? And why did, why my question, no one ever apologised to me personally, and I forgive people because I find that is very healing. Why did they have to put that bit in? Why? 
And why do they have to film me in the shower as part of the show? Why? I mean, that's something I just still don't know the answer to. You know, and it's probably ratings and whatever it is. But I mean, I don't know. And then for it to continue and continue. I mean, someone brought something up from your past, right? And they brought it up every two months for 23 years. Out the blue, you'd be walking along, walking the dog, you know, or going shopping. And suddenly someone would poke you in the back and say, Chris, and then, and then, wouldn't that do something to your brain? I think this is why so many people aren't. I, I know it's Channel 4, isn't it? But uh, so many people are not paying their BBC licence fee now because they're, they're just fed up with this kind of nonsense, you know, this just fake narrative all the time and, and, and playing the people as if they're idiots. And it's just all low vibrational, crappy well, titillation, irony, isn't it? Yeah. And I, well, I didn't know it was coming back this year. So that's quite interesting because obviously then it helps with my book maybe i don't know who knows mm. um but the irony is every single message i've got thousands of them um although i'm exaggerating probably mum um they're all saying can we have real people you know can we can it not be can it be nostalgic can it go back to beating chickens people being normal don't have any wannabes in there don't have any trouble is though we're so so media aware now you know, um, you'll, they know, they'll know how to, I, they'll, you know, will someone be genuine? I was, put, I, what you see now is what you saw in there, you know, you, genuine. I was just myself, you know, and if I felt like laughing or, you know, being silly, or doing a silly dance, and ironically, looking back on YouTube, um, a lot of, uh, what happened was they, I can't believe, I didn't realise, I couldn't meet me in the mirror because these huge mirrors were everywhere. So I didn't realise. I thought it was just the cameras moving round on the top bit. So I'm getting ready in the morning, squeezing my bum up against the mirror thing, putting me what's you know. And there's about five cameramen behind there because I was allowed to walk through the alley, the walkway afterwards because I hosted Big Brother's Little Brother. <clears throat> I couldn't believe it. The house was so small, and there was a and it, like the Truman Show, you know, a house within a house, and literally. Every wall was a mirror, was a, was the them looking into us, looking into them. So obviously I, you know, meet me at the mirror, meet yourself at the mirror, find yourself. But also the mirror of me is what was shown to you through that mirror. And, um, you know, and I think to myself, but I was myself. But the irony, when I watched it back on YouTube for the first time last year, um, all the, all this, all the episodes are there. And every day is about me. And in my two weeks and then and then in the evening the, they're all talking about me and then they're saying like um you know doesn't she know the cameras there so even they had a bit more awareness i didn't think about the cameras you know i was just having a laugh you know i think it's pretty obvious why they focused on you because you, you know you 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 would have proverbial cracker weren't you well, um, I was, yeah you know and and I hate to say it but sex sales and Yes. Um, yes. I mean, you know, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure you were every young man's what do you call it fantasy no. for oh, no. so uh, prob oh, st still are still our penny, but you you, no. you know. Oh, behave. Oh, behave. <laughs> um, but yeah, but it's yeah. I just think it's a funny old world. I always say it's a funny old world. It's. I mean, they, yeah. I mean, as far as Channel Four producers, they must have thought they. You know they they they've hit gold, haven't they? With you, I mean, um, as yeah. with respect to the cameras, in a scientific experiment, you know, quasi scientific experiment like Big Brother, you're not supposed to know where the cameras are, are you? That would that that completely defeats the object of having secret cameras. If yeah, you, yeah. If you tell yeah. the contestants, um, can I just ask a few practical questions? Because, um, like I say, I've never, re you know, I've I've sort of. I think right back in the early days, I watched it out of curiosity. Certainly, no disrespect to your good self, but I, could, I couldn't watch it now. It's literally like the worst side of humanity that people watch that stuff. What about crew, like camera crew, producers and that? Are they popping into the house all the time to say, right, can you do this? Can you do that? Or, 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 or not? No. Our house was used by Big Brother One and I and the first celebrity Big Brother, and it was absolutely simple. So that uh, the ones since then are glamour glamorized. We had 
um, they wanted it to be like a normal Swedish type house. It was very wood. They, they had a big brother voice, but because they were trying to create a level of tension, so because our tasks, we had to build a fire and keep it alive. So obviously sleep deprivation. Thank God they let us keep the clock. But they would, the voice of Big Brother would be the producer for that day or evening. And they would suddenly come over and it was like in a tannoy in an airport or tannoy in a, in a, you know, in a supermarket. And then it would be like, Ugh! so that's to get you, get you really, it would really get my nerves on edge. Um, and the diary room, ironically, I noticed in the ones that followed, became very warm with big, beautiful diary room chairs and a beautiful theme. Ours was like a dark room. It's almost like you would take where you take a prisoner. And it was like grey cloth, black plastic flooring, a really manky black sort of chair um, and a tiny little screen where this voice would speak through to you. So, no, I didn't want to go in there to talk to them about how I felt. I found them absolutely terrifying. There was, um, they didn't, there was one time my girls, well, they were shouting outside, so the producers made us come back in, but there's one time someone threw the football results over the, over the, um, over the, you know, over the fence, whatever, you know, and we had, and then we had, to, we had to go in the house and we were all excited to think that someone else, because by then we were, so isolated from humanity, we were like, oh my God, there's a human being in our home. Like it was like a really, I remember that feeling, I think it was about a week in and whenever the football was on the massive football thing. And I remember it being like, oh, there's a human walking around our house. Um, so that was that was really weird. And then I got the, the doctor to see Brian, so he had something wrong with a tooth. And then we were like, oh, oh Brian's meeting a human. A human. Hmm. We were really out of it. We were like, oh, you know, just oh dear, like so strange thinking that there was, but they never, we never, never saw them, and they shut the door and said they won't be opened again till till the first eviction. I thought, oh, great, because a terrible door checking problem at the time, and that was it. Then when they did open, that was my first experience suddenly of humans again, you know. Hmm. But it was what? a very, it was just a very simple, very very simple little house it was we had chickens we had two goldfish with some rice and pasta and and nothing else you know there, there was nothing and we had some boring boring tasks we had the fire tasks and we had a blooming first aid task i thought you could have done something more fun you know to bond people like you know team building you know more you know then the, the first aid one we re re revised that for about four days and then it was only on for about 10 minutes and i thought Great. So there was no element of people really, you know, because creativity is a good way, which I've done in theatre workshops, you know, to get people to really come together and be in a, a really wacky challenge. You know, uh, we did a calendar. We were allowed to make a calendar. So that was fun. They gave us a camera. And that was probably the first time we were all actually really quite united and happy. Elizabeth went in the den. They they put a den in the garden. So they were trying to alert to maybe someone would, snog in there whatever and she went in then did um did a did her shoot with just a scarf over her breast but that wasn't picked up by anyone i think she was holding a magazine up a boys magazine and that was her calendar shot but that didn't get on the papers mm. you know so she was doing that you know and she probably would have wouldn't have minded that i don't know don't know in my opinion but um, what no, was the, uh, so what was the dynamic like and does it start to get annoying people's you know, idiosyncratic habits? Well, I did all the cooking because no one else offered. And then that became an issue because like in lockdown, the magnified, the, the menial is magnified. So suddenly that was a problem. I said, here I go again. Everywhere I go, so there's a problem. There's a problem with me. You're too loud. You're too funny. You're too, you You must be on drugs. You know, you're doing all the cooking. I said, well, look, so I fed the chickens. I did all the cooking and they love my food. Um, so that was an issue. So I handed that over to, you know, Bubble was an ammo and everyone. Um, and then they'd come to me going, what are we having for dinner? And they're like, well, you know, and that's when I did my in the kitchen, out the kitchen. And that I was that was shouted at me. That was a nice thing. That was shouted at me for, you know, like probably about seven years because I danced in the kitchen, out the kitchen, to giving instructions, but pretending I wasn't doing the cooking, even though I was doing the cooking again, um, if that makes any sense. And, um, but yeah, I, I got, I, 
I got on with them, but everybody was um, really, really intense. Everyone was, I think, intense. Um, and, and there was a two old older people with me, Stuart and Dean, but I didn't, I managed to talk to Dean quite a bit, but, I, but when I write it up in my book, I wish I'd found out more about their lives, like you're saying to me about your childhood. I mean, Paul spoke German, I speak German, you know. I could have talked to him about his job in Germany or something, but I, we never got round to actually, the trouble is we never got round to actually really sharing honestly with each other. No one, uh, we sat there once and they said to us around that they said, uh, gave us a task of saying something about our lives. And, and now I, I said to them, Oh, well, you know, I had my, um, my, uh, um, I had a breast implants done for my personal self when I was 30, finally, you know, and that was it. No one asked how, how anything, you know, that was it. So I, I thought, well, I'll just shut down. I, so I didn't find anyone in there that I could, like you were saying, drawing, drawing out something from them and sharing with them. And I, I knew Narinda afterwards for a bit and Brian, but we never, looking back now, we could have all helped each other so much more. You know, I could mm. have said, what are you doing? Or how are you coping with the money? Or what do you say when they ask you to go on telly? Or, you know, we never asked, we never... I, we never shared anything but it was I think we're all in our own bubble of probably that's mine I don't want to share it because do you all, I remember, do you all keep in touch now well I've I, well because I joined social media one of the uh, uh, Stuart I run the one I had a row with Bubble and Narinda I, I, and Josh in he lives abroad now but it's just that sort of little little moments here then everywhere <laughs> so that's fine but we never Helped. We never. I didn't. We never helped each other afterwards. I don't know why, mm. and I don't know if that's what happens because I think there's. It was the first and second one. I was doing um a big thing with uh, Vanessa Feltz and something. I had to give an award away at a huge award with one of the Big Brother the with the winner of Big Brother One, and he didn't want to give the award away with me. So there was that thing of holding a minute. I'm more fake. You know, maybe in my opinion. You know, maybe I don't want to share it with you. You came out first. I don't know. I didn't question it. I just said, "Well, you do the award then," mm -hmm. and that, and then, and I let them get on with it. But I think there's an element of, I think with all of us, there's an element of I'm not going to sh share that. I don't know. It's weird. We all were in this strange world of having loads and loads of jobs and interviews, and we never really shared anything. We should have sat down and gone right. What are we all doing? You know, because we're the only. There's only there's ten of us, and we're the only ones in the only reality show, in the only reality TV in the whole of the world. And this has happened to us. So what can we do now to pull the sources together? Yeah. And, yeah. I, and that's hindsight. That's hindsight. And, you know, that's now gone. That opportunity has gone. But I bet if we all sat down, we could have probably, you know, done some really good stuff together. Mm. You know, Was it um, back when you did it? I'm not sure the for format, but were was it like, did they vote you out back then? Was it like a public yeah. vote or was it a, a based on something else? Yeah, they've changed it now because they didn't want me to go. Uh, what, then you voted out who you wanted voted out. So that was the, but now what they, they do, they did the, I didn't watch it much after, but they changed the format mm. so that you voted who you wanted to keep in. So, and they do a lot of that with the shows now. So, instead of you know so so then they get to keep the people in that they really want to keep in so it's really weird psychology so but what they did with the first and second one was you voted out who you wanted out so that then didn't give anyone any chance of having a, a second chance you know and i was and, and and who knows what the votes were like then because you know like with the phones because my mum's phone was hacked mm. um but i haven't done anything about that either um but i might do and then um but with the votes i was 52 percent and helen was whatever the rest of it was um but was that was that the case how many people did you get down to before you before you left i was the first you were first to be voted yeah. out yeah but two weeks i've only had i had two weeks in there that's it that's really and then bizarre I, was out. I didn't even have a home to go back to <laughs> you, you would have thought as far as the producers are concerned they, they'd they want you to be in there well right they did but because of the way the votes are done, it's, that's why they changed it, I think, in my opinion. I keep saying my opinion so I don't get in trouble. But I think that's why they changed it. They must have had a massive 
it said in those articles, you know, they're ter terrified of me coming out, you know, because if I go out, but I did. So then they were like, oh, what do we do now? But thank God, then they had another storyline because Paul and Helen got together. So they had that line. But That's no, really it, bizarre. Um, yeah, two what, weeks I was in there. What was it like coming out of the house? Oh, man. Well, when I went in, we it was literally the size of a bus stop, right? Um, little, 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 um, little, um, oh dear, steel walkway. Yeah. And yeah. we had to hide behind a corrugated plastic sheet so I could see someone's feet. And then we were brought out, and these guys in security with our station dogs um, walked us down little diddy diddy. And there was two people seeing everyone off, diddy diddy. And then there was about, whatever, 50 or 100 um, people, you know, the, the press at the other end. And then you went in. Well, blimey, when I came out, the door opened. It was dark, um, you know, 10 o'clock at night, whatever. And there's all these Alsatian dogs barking at me, flashing lights, you know, absolutely nightmare. Reminds me a bit of Cyprus, actually. And I started walking up my little diddy steel way. And I thought, where, the, where, where on earth am I? I had to walk for about 15 minutes. I was walking, walking, walking. Then I came to a massive gate. Then I came through a gate, there was a bridge, and the noise hit me. Um, the noise, the people there, I mean, how humbling. And they didn't stop cheering for, for about two or three hours. Um, and Dean says in the house, because they were locked in the house, he says, they're uh, cheering for you, Helen. He said, it must be a tape, because they, they couldn't go out, so they couldn't believe how long it was going on for. Cheer, 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 cheer. Thousands and thousands and thousands. Mm. And then I have to walk all the way over this bridge, and then I meet Peter, and he just says to me, your, 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 your job's safe and you're a household name. I thought, what's he talking about? And then I walk down, down, down these steps. And then I suddenly see Davina massively pregnant. I thought, please don't give birth. And she takes my shoes off me because I thought my high heels were going to get caught in the steel thing. Um, and then we go into what was known as the Scent Nerve Hub. And that's where all my friends were. Looking back at that interview was really painful, actually, because she I didn't get any, I didn't know what was going on you know, about outside world. So been on the front page for two weeks with my towel dropping. And she says, we at one point in the interview, very quickly, she says, you deliberately, you showed us your nether regions. You decided to show us your nether regions or deliberately showed your nether regions. But what about this? And then she turns to that one. I want to go all the way. I don't know what was on the back of that. I think it was the nudie thing. So she's suddenly holding this one up. And I'm suddenly thinking, what do you mean I want to go all the way? I'm Christian. You know, the, the house was 10 minutes from my school. And so I forgot what she was going on about my, you know, bitsies, my nether regions. Immediately, you know, I'm on the what's... And then I said, no, of course not. And she kept probing me. Did you want to have sex? Did, were you going to have sex? Were you deliberately going to have sex? I, I thought, this is a joke, you know? And I said, no. But if I'd known... Uh, and I thought it was all funny. And I thought that's going to be just a laugh. And I laughed at all the things she showed there's me jumping on Paul. Well, that's been edited because, you know, that was out of context and that out of context. That out, and I laughed. I thought well, it's just going to be for show because I was in awe of her being famous. So I'm not going to say to her, hold on a minute, that's not right. And then um, and then uh, and, and I laugh at it. All, and I just think to myself, it's like with all of us, you have a Friday night night out. You do the funky chicken dance. You know, you chat to someone you're never going to see again, you know, and then it's over. No, no. I didn't realise the enormity of that interview and what I regret most, because that would have been fantastic telly, if I'd known I'd been on the front page of all the magazines and everything, I would have absolutely let rip. <laughs> Let's see. I'd have gone, what? She wouldn't have got questioning. I would have gone nuts in that studio. That would have been prime. I was in the top five bet most best bits of 2001, when they do the top uh, out of a hundred top five bits of the year, but I tell you, if I'd let rip in that studio, I would have really been like, right, I, they would have seen, you know, something. But because I didn't know anything, you know, no one, um, and they're not allowed to do that now. Because when and 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 um, Colin came out of the, you know, the the, the the whatever it is the other reality show, he was immediately debriefed about the media, so he was prepared. And I went straight from that interview to, um, into a press conference. I had no idea what they were talking about. And then I had to go into my room and choose that blooming um, offer. And I only chose the magazine one, even though it was 20 grand less. The money that was on the table is unbelievable. 
And I chose that because I didn't want to be in the tabloid. And then they sold it to the tabloid. Ugh. Does that make sense? It does. So, Penny, tell us, um, at, at, at what point did you kind of hit your low moment then with all of this? Yeah, well, I think it's it started to creep up on me as I was out of control in, in 2002. You know, I didn't, mm. I didn't have my money. You know, you had friends around you just using you and stuff. You know, I didn't have my old friends. I didn't have my life, you know, normal. I didn't have normal. Um, and I think that's very sacred if you have got a place that you can call home. Because it didn't go away, um, I came down here and I was very depressed. And I, I, made, I made the best of it. You know, started running. It's very good for the soul. You know, got myself a bit together, found a church um, and started trying to figure out what to do. But I just felt, but, but I would say I just, and I wrote my first book, um, which is about prayers and things. Uh, but I was, I just felt suicidal. I don't know. I can't, you can't shift it. I don't, when you've got something, when you're depressed, it, you, it's, it's horrible, you know, and you just can't seem to get out of, out of it. So I'd get on, I'd get up in the morning, you know, and, and have a, you know, do everything. But I just felt wrong. I didn't feel like I, I didn't, feel I belonged anywhere and I didn't feel whole I didn't feel at peace so it just got worse and worse and then I chose you know obviously all the bullying at schools and then I chose um a, a partner I didn't mention I mentioned him in the book obviously didn't mention his name uh um and that meant me, I was in hospital and everything you know I nearly killed you know what I mean that was really bad and he was a real you know anyway uh so that was really scary and that took about that took two years, about a year of my life. I think that was my lowest point. And then I think from 2007, mum and dad decided because they used to keep going back to Spain and then coming back. So I lived here on my own. And I did. Um, I made some films and I put um, little short films with this guy. And I made. Um, I did a, a theatre production, you know, for the for the for the town. So I did some really nice things, but I was constantly in a state of dread, lurgy crying I don't know you know just really odd and really you know eating and then not eating and I don't know the mess and I think when mum and dad moved back probably 2007 full time I think that's when I you know started getting a bit more stable having their sanity like you're saying have good good people around you um and then obviously uh, meeting Mark and over the years becoming you know that that sort of solid foundation of consistency I think if you don't have consistency in your life and you're just well even like as a as a as a you know I, you know from pillar to post i think i just was just doing that whole thing like you're doing as an army child you know do a bit of teaching that do that then bang there then that there then that then just everything was um out of control i don't know if that makes any sense did you have a like a rock bottom epiphany moment or i mean you mentioned you're a christian and and you know, was was that a thread that ran through all all your life? Was at one point where that that faith became stronger, or yeah, that did. It's always been this since we became Christians in Cyprus. So I became a Christian at five. So I've never let go of my faith, even mm. though I've wandered off and made bad choices. Um, and God's, but you see, if you know God's got hold of you, then that's a reality, and you've got to know that because that's something that happens in in conversion and it, something that you is between you and god it's a private thing and you know that he loves you and he saved you and he died for you and he rose again and he loves you and when you know that as a reality then that that presence of god and peace is greater mm -hmm. even though you you go off and you know whatever you know do all sorts you know god it, and you you and it won't and it and again like with things that won't leave you god never left me so he constantly bring me back from you know the despair that the, the suicidal thoughts that over drinking whatever i was doing you know the mess crazy friends whatever and he'd bring me and i'd keep coming back to that point where i knew that was the only piece that was my reality um and that's sort of something that grew better I'd say after 2007, it became stronger. And I wrote, I've written about two or three Christian books, whether I get them published or not. Um, and I've just wrote it all out because um, that's how I sort of work. Um, and I know now, and it's become stronger. I gave God this book 
in 2020. Mark didn't want, want to know anything about Big Brother. Why, why should he? And then suddenly, all of, out of the blue, he suddenly went, because I was downstairs praying, said, Lord, I don't want to do this on my own. If you want to use this book to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captives free, please, if you if you want to, here I am. I pay with, I, you know, I paid a bit with the publisher. You know, I, I don't mind, I'm not looking for fame and fortune. I'm just would like, Lord, if you can use this for something. And then next thing you know, Mark goes, I, I need to read this. I need to read, um, I need to read this. So he read the first draft and he said, "You well, you can't put a page in there for being in the house. I just put, I went in the big brother house. <laughs> so he said, you've got to write deeper. I said, Mark, I can't, I can't. And he, poor bloke went through five different drafts, you know, and printed off. And I come back because I washed up in Morrison, come back from Morrison's and they have all these sticky notes. I was like, no, no. He said, you've got to explain that. You've got to explain that. You can't, you, you can't just go, I was really upset. You know, you've got to explain it. Mm. Ah, man. So this book, has, I, I, it's been the hardest thing I've ever written. It's been the most painful thing I've ever written. Um, uh, um, and it just took everything to write it. And you know what? It set me, it's really freed me. The, God runs through it. But I do say to people, you know, you can skip that bit. And a couple of people have gone, I love the book, just skip the religious bits. Well, let me get on with it. That's fine. I'm not judging anyone. But it's the hardest thing to suddenly really, really face the whole of you, like mental, physical, emotional, financial, spiritual, uh, and write the whole thing down. Uh, and when I finished it, I had a massive, massive abscess. Came, blew up the day after I finished it. Most disgusting thing in the world. And so, well, anyway, a massive thing in the hospital. Gross. Anyway, sorry, I'm saying all the wrong things. No, it. it's fine. But, yeah, but it's um, there it is. Yeah, uh, but at the end of the day, it's it, it's just yeah, just just you, you know, if if it helps someone, that's you know, thing you know. And I just think to myself, well, it must have been meant to be because why did Mark suddenly come in my life? Why did why did the publisher come in my life, Morgan Lawrence? You know, he only does football. He does footballers' books. You know, and why would he take a reality star on? You know. Maybe he's so, hoping you're going to try out for the England team. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then um, and then why did that TikTok guy come along? And then obviously getting little, you know, people helping me like yourself, suddenly mm. uh, little old me, you know, has been suddenly on your show or, you know, all the other, you know, little things that are happening. I'm thinking, well, it's got to be a reason, you know, it's not, not you know, so maybe, and why, did it, why suddenly is there well very surprising why suddenly people interested and actually wanting me on their shows you know spent the 23 years being being you know just no, no nothing I didn't expect to get any interviews and then um surely for me that's like God saying right we're gonna go you know this is the right way and maybe this time round you can do it properly in some way so I just don't know where I'm gonna land but maybe Maybe I'll, you know, maybe get do something, you know, do some charity. I don't know what I'll do, but I'll just see what what I do. And I just hope I land somewhere where I can be of real use, like you say, you know. But if not, then it's been a wonderful journey and I can do my little little TikTok things and that's fine. But if I get mm. to use my skills, that would be nice because, I, you know, at the end of the day, I've, you know, not been able to be a – I was a brilliant teacher, a brilliant theatre uh, director you know I've been a brilliant creative person you know and I think to myself you know um but anyway beside the thought if 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 there's somewhere to land and it might just be a little women's group down at my washing up job you know and everyone gets a bit of a laugh from it that's fine because you don't don't expect anything in life you know this is a trouble with people they want they expect people expect things mm. I mean I remember being homeless in Hong Kong and chronically addicted to crystal meth and and uh, I just got fired from a, I got fired by the Hong Kong triads <laughs> only from my job oh. as only, I was only a nightclub doorman for them. Yeah. But, but I remember I sunk down on the pavement amongst all the litter. Yeah, I, I remember did. think, I remember thinking, I wonder if this is like the lowest moment of my yeah. life. And here's the thing, no penny. 
I love that moment in my life just as much as I love being sat here now talking to you. Yeah. And I love myself just as much back then as I, you know, as, as you're supposed to do. And yeah. as, I, as I, as I do now. And I love that part of my journey as much as I'm, and it, and it, it might come again next week as far as I'm concerned. And do you know what? Couldn't care less. <laughs> Couldn't care less. Um, I'm just happy to be here. It's, uh, it's, you- um, there's no, I don't think there's a destination. I think it's just about enjoying the ride. And But you give so much, you know, like you do the great British speakers and you do that. What's that gold? You won the veteran award gold. What was that? Yeah, there we go. Look, a little, little bit of showing off uh, English, Wowzers. English, um, yeah. veterans awards. Yeah. Ins- inspiration of the year. We get eternal life. But in this set of molecules, you just get one shot at it, you know, and then, yeah. then we, we change form and we become other beautiful parts of life. Well, in this one set of molecules, just get out there and smash it. <laughs> you know, li- live your life. Not that's what I've always done, Penny. You know, yeah. I we used to get free flights in the military. Well, you you know this because you've you've lived abroad. You know that military personnel travel around the world, and and those seats that aren't taken up. Oh, yes. The the RAF sell them off cheap. They call them indulgence, right? So could I get anyone to go to Hong Kong with me for Christmas? Uh -uh. No. They's all like, no, I'm going down to pub, Chris. I'm going to watch DVD. You know, it it wasn't even DVDs back then. It was videos. We're going to watch videos with my missus. And so I'll just go off to Hong Kong. Wow. On a flight that cost me 40 quid, and that was just the admin fee. I probably probably drank about 80 quid's worth of beer on the on the courtesy of british airways yeah um landed in hong kong had an absolute blast massive eye opener saw the most beautiful women like i just didn't think women could be that beautiful it was just incredible yeah. saw some incredible i mean i was involved in a mass crush where i've just came out of the pub on new year's eve in a place called lang kwai fong and there was some um, I think it was 21 people crushed to death in the street outside in the New Year's <laughs> revelings, right? No. I'm not saying that was a good thing, but I am saying that's an I, uh, you know, yeah. it's like welcome to Asia, you know? Yeah. And one lad, um, Chinese gangster, running up and down the street with an AK 47 in a failed, um, uh. you know, a failed robbery attempt on a jeweler's store. And uh, he managed to wing one women one innocent you know shopper and um oh, she man. got she got killed and the police come for a big shootout and you're hearing all this like bang, bang, bang. then i hopped on a flight to thailand just because you know i'd heard about in fact no i wanted to go to the philippines got to the airport and i missed the flight so I said to the, the, the girl at the information d- desk or the airline desk, like, Is, have you got any other flights going anywhere? She said, we've got Bangkok, sir, leaving in 20 minutes. I said, oh. get, me on, get me on that one. <laughs> right. Wow. So I had uh, a, a week in Thailand as a, as a 22 year old. And wow. we're talking, we're talking, this is 25 years ago when yeah. there was n- no law in, you know, it was lawless. Anything goes in, in Bangkok back then. Yeah. Right. And, it was just I met this really nice South African lad and we travelled around and we got in lots of trouble. That's when I got my nose nose broken, fighting a a, a Thai doorman. <laughs> right? yeah, and yeah. uh and then come back to Hong Kong, I found out you could get a train to China. I thought, I wonder if I can go to mainland China, you know, wow. com- communist China as yeah. a Brit- as a British serviceman. So I hopped on the train. And I just went, I got to the border and I was expecting to be arrested and, you know, or at least turned around. No, they took me little immigration card that I filled out, stamped it, you know, stamped my passport. I'm wandering around China. Wow. Whoa, whoa. 30 years ago, Penny. Yeah. I was like a rock star. Not that I need to be like a rock star, but I was like a rock star. Everyone. Yeah. Everyone was just coming out of everywhere yeah. to look to look at yeah. me. You know, it yeah. was in, it, it was incredible. I, I got back to Hong Kong, and I heard that you can hop on a hoverfoil 
like a like a you know like a hovercraft hydrofoil or some something and you can go to macau wow that's another place they got all the casinos there so i hopped on a hover foil and next thing i'm i'm wandering around um the casinos in in macau so oh, I, I get back to england <laughs> after i don't know three weeks of just sheer hedonism and eye-opening experience and my mate smudge has he's been in a pub and he's watched yeah he's watched videos with his missus <laughs> yeah, yeah. And i'm like exactly which like there's only one option there for me. You know, there's only one option. So I'd just say to anyone, take charge of your life because otherwise you just end up going with the flow and, and the flow is so banal. The flow just believe what they see on the television. It tells yeah. them what to do and how to live their life and it puts them in this little box. It's stepping out of your comfort zones, isn't it? It's stepping out and, and daring to live. Mm. And a lot of people don't have that courage. That's yeah. the trouble. You want to try and encourage that because they don't have the courage to step out of what they know is safe and do something where they don't know it's going to be safe. But if you don't yeah. do something that you don't know is going to be safe, you're never going to know what you're able to achieve, maybe. And also, you, you know, you it builds your character. Like you're saying, one minute you're on the street, you know, and, I, you know, one minute you're doing that, next minute you're doing that. And it's having that strength of character, um, mm -hmm. which, but that's that's when you dare to live. Life is damaging. It's traumatizing. All this media, whether it's TV, so it it's it the inherentness there is to damage people beyond belief. It's not healthy. It's not, you know, it it, it can be used nicely. You know, you get in touch with an old friend you haven't seen for twenty years. That you know, really, it's incredibly damaging on people's psyche for young people. Um, the 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 simple fact if you put a picture of yourself on Instagram with your shirt off you get significantly more likes than right. if you put a picture with your shirt on, right? That right. is weird. It is pervertedly bizarre. It's all about keeping people in what's called the lower animal self as opposed to their enlightened upper self, right? But that's that's another one. But here's the thing. All these people are striving not to live mediocre lives. Yeah. And yet what do ha, what do they do? They do what the telly tells them to do. I'm referring to the last three years, folks. All right. You, you know. Yeah. And when you're wandering around Tesco with your underpants on your face, like th that's why you're living a mediocre life. You know, yeah. you've got to raise your game, folks. Right. Yeah. You start educating yourself about what's what in life. Um, take charge of your health. Take charge of your your well-being yeah. ignore as we've discussed you've got to ignore the haters because they're just yeah. people that haven't that are battling trauma that they haven't yeah. overcome it and they're projecting yeah. that onto other people because they're so upset and they're so unhappy right and yeah. and, and that's just life that's yeah. you're always going to get these individuals gotta you know yeah. be nice to them be courteous but, but don't take their shit yeah. on board your shit yeah. you know so yeah. penny listen it's been absolutely wonderful talking <laughs> to you we're gonna you're gonna send me all your links we're gonna put them below the video folks we'll put a link for the book on amazon so you can scoot over there and uh, grab yourselves a copy penny stay on you just show us the cover go on <laughs> promote the hell out of it there we go yeah hooray meet meet me at the mirror what a great title there, before um, and after Right. Yes. To our friends at home, hope you enjoyed this. It's fascinating. Always wanted to ask some questions about Big Brother. Um, but it's lovely to meet Penny and see she's doing so well. If you could like and subscribe, folks, really, really would appreciate it. Please consider if you can support us on Patreon for one ninety nine a month. Just helps us to pay our editor and expenses and stuff. And uh, that just leaves me to say much, much love to you. Take care.